this uh, uh, understanding leading to the agreement in three months uh, will have built in unprecedented uh, access uh, and transparency. Uh, we, will be, we will have eyes on, principally through the International Atomic Energy Agency, we'll have eyes on the entire supply chain of uranium. Let's get to work. Our guest is senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research and former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, Jed Babin. Jed, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Let's get down to the salesmanship idea that I brought up right at the beginning here. In your opinion, now that we've seen everybody talk on Sunday and banter back and forth, who's selling this the best, the president or those who are against it? Well, I think the opponents have a much better argument. I mean, number one, this isn't a deal yet. And we know the president is making a whole lot of assertions that the Iranians disagree with. So at this point, we don't know what the agreement is going to be, what the basis for it really is going to be. And we know, for example, that it won't cover one of the most crucial points of the entire debate is that the Iranian missile system, they're developing intercontinental ballistic missiles. They have developed a number that are probably capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And this is not even addressed at all. So if we're not gonna cover the missile, why are we not going to do you know, a whole lot more negotiations and try to force the Iranians into something that might actually mean something? All right, right now, now it's not doing it. To your point, and also to Benjamin Netanyahu, here was his appearance on one of the Sunday talk shows. He was on Meet the Press, and here he talked about his preference for a diplomatic solution, but here we go. I prefer a diplomatic solution. You know why? Because for any military option, the country that will pay the biggest price is always Israel. So we want a diplomatic solution, but a good one, one that rolls back Iran's inf uh, nuclear infrastructure and one that ties the final lifting of restrictions on Iran's nuclear program with the change of Iran's behavior, namely that they stop their aggression in the region, mm -hmm. that they stop their worldwide terrorism, and that they stop calling and working for the annihilation of Israel. Is there any indication, Jed, whatsoever that we might be missing and we might be overlooking it in our zealousness, but any indicator whatsoever that Israel is, or I should say that Iran is ready to change its behavior toward Israel and the rest of the Middle East? None whatsoever. And what we have to look at is history to prove all of that. Number one, if you realize the record of the Iranian regime since 1979 when they came to power, there has never been an instance, not one single instance, where diplomacy changed their behavior that resulted in them going back and saying, we're not going to do it that way anymore. It's just never happened. So why should we believe it would now? And I think when you look at the president saying, well, you know, if Israel is attacked, we're going to be just at their side immediately. Well, you know, that strikes me as another line in the sand. And that didn't work too well in Syria or all the other places that Obama drew a line. He doesn't follow his own promises. That's the biggest danger. Jed, let me play devil's advocate here for a moment, all right? Let's just say that for whatever reason, let's assume, and I know, of course, the problem with the word assume, we all know what that is, that the Iranians are tired of basically having our foot on their throat and the rest of the world as well. They see that their economy is suffering. They've got billions of dollars sitting there. They want to become richer. They want to help fund themselves. The government wants to make more, whatever you want. Put money in their pocket clandestinely, whatever. But they finally decided that this is the only way that we can do it is to become a wealthy nation once again, and maybe even one to become more powerful than Saudi Arabia with all of our economics behind us. What do you think? Well, I just don't think that that's the right assumption. I mean, obviously, we always know the problem with assumptions. The problem with that one is that there is, number one, no sign of it. And number two, Iran is not motivated that way. The theology of their regime requires them to build weapons that will essentially allow them to conquer the earth and starting with the Middle East. So this is not a regime which is motivated by profit. They may, and, and you know, frankly, our throat, our, our, our foot is not on their throat. The sanctions are having some effect, but not a whole lot, not enough to change their behavior. And that's the failure of the sanctions. So all of this talk about sanctions doing this and sanctions doing that and sanctions being immediately reimposed, it's really just talk. And it's really not valuable because we know the sanctions will not work now, will, are not working now, and will not work in the future. I only got about 30 seconds, but Senator John Thune is the one who this weekend said, we had our foot on the throat and we let them up, and that sanctions were working. I'm going to guess that you disagree with that. Well, I think Mr. Thune is guilty only of exaggerating the effect, and that's a big problem. I think they are suffering some. They're probably not suffering much. And the problem they have right now is that they can't export oil. The real issue now is, is it worth this deal? Is it worth 
setting them aside, setting the sanctions aside and letting them grow more rich. It's not going to change their behavior. It has never changed their behavior. None of the sanctions that have been engaged in prior to this time have worked. So why do we think the sanctions are going to work even in the future? We'll dig into that just a little bit further. Jed, if you would, please stand by just a couple of moments. We'll take a break. And when we come back, a little bit more from BB's side of things and more on the Iranian nuclear... Midpoint continues. Let's return to an issue on the other side of the world that reaches into every American life one way or another. Welcome back the former Under Secretary of Defense and current senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research, Jed Babin. Jed, let me focus right on that for a moment. We speak, 90% of our audience is what I like to call Joe and Jane Beer Can, the people who are sitting at home who have to worry about their kids, their lives, their car payments, and so much more. They see Iran on the other side of the planet. They hear about nuke deals and the president and the all these negotiations, and they really wonder, how is this ever going to affect me? Why do I care? How do we then make them understand that what could happen in Iran could indeed affect every American for generations? Well, I think we've seen for, well, for generation now, uh, the fact that Iran is the principal sponsor of terrorism around the world. I mean, in their history, they have, for example, taken the lives of Oh, 241 Marines. I think the total was 250 some American casualties in Beirut in 1983. You go through Iraq, they have basically armed the Iraqi resistance through our invasion, helped them resist Americans and kill Americans. At this point, they're sponsoring terrorism everywhere. So if you want to reduce terrorism, it goes back to what Netanyahu says. You have to force Iran to give up the sponsorship of terrorism, and we're not doing that. But how do you force them, Jed? There it is right there, the crux of the whole matter. How do you make somebody give up something that they are generationally involved in, that they have been doing for decades, and that if you look at the theology of the country, it is what they believe is the right way to live? Well, I think what you have to do is keep the sanctions on very, very strongly, and you have to support the Iranian resistance. In 2009, there was almost a revolution in Iran, which would have ended this regime. But President Obama chose to not send them help. And as a result, the Yamullahs are still there. So we have to take our opportunities. I don't think you can have peace with this regime. You just simply can't. In the Middle East and reaching out here, we're in danger of terrorist attacks and fur further resistance to American operations around the world as long as this regime is in power. And let's look at one other facet here that I really don't think got a lot of attention over the weekend, and that is Saudi Arabia. Now, according to this deal, we have not taken away all of the possibilities that Iran could use to get a nuclear weapon. The Saudi nuclear program has been in mothballs for a while now. They really haven't felt that they've needed it now. The fact that we are going to cut this deal, do you think then that it would force Saudi Arabia again then to crank up, other states to crank up, and we are simply starting a whole new nuclear proliferation in the Middle East? No question. And the Saudis have already said as much. They're going to get their mothballs out of their nuclear program, as you put it. And they have probably already ordered nuclear weapons from Pakistan. We know there have been a lot of contacts there, back and forth, and the Pakistanis will probably supply them with nuclear weapons. There's going to be a nuclear race in the Middle East. Israel, we know, already has nuclear weapons. And, you know, you see very, very strange things happening. As a result of this deal, the Saudis have formed their own army among the Arab nations. They're trying to intervene in Yemen. And, you know, when the Israelis are saying that we applaud the formation of an Arab army in the face of the Iran threat, there's something really interesting going on here. And it's not going to be in, well, frankly, it's not going to help restore stability until Iran is disarmed. But what about the possibility? The possibility, and again, we've always got to look at those, Jed, that with all this military buildup, that we may reach a point where we will see a Middle Eastern mad, if you will, mutually assured destruction that the U.S. and the Russians went at for so many years, and that they're finally going to get to the point of saying, okay, look, we hate each other to death. We would just as soon blow you off the map, but we realize we don't want to start something for which there would be no end. Well, Ed, I think that's a lousy bet. It's possible, and, you know, that's probably the best we can hope for at this point. But if you see the Sunni-Shiite struggle in the Middle East, it's a war that's been going on for a thousand years or more. And this is the kind of thing that is going to probably result in a nuclear exchange over there. Whether it would affect us directly here, I don't know. God forbid. But this is the kind of thing that we risk. And Obama is definitely risking this nuclear proliferation. Frankly, it's going on in Iran right now. It's already there in Israel. The Saudis are going to do it. The Kuwaitis, who knows? So you're ending up with a vastly less stable situation in the Middle East than we've ever known before.
Is it, in your opinion, then insulting if Barack Obama says, as he recently said and said to Tom Friedman in the New York Times, that this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and that we have got the backs of the people of Israel? Well, we certainly are insulting the people of Israel, and they know it. They know they can't rely on us as long as Obama is president. That's why you have Mr. Netanyahu going his own way. And quite frankly, that's why you have the Saudis going their own way, too. They have divorced themselves. The Saudis, don't forget, two years ago, gave up and threw away a seat on the U.N. Security Council because they so drastically disagreed with the, uh, with the American policy, with Obama's policy. So you're not going to have anybody saddling up and saying, hey, America is our leader. And that's not happening anymore. You're just not going to see American leadership because people don't trust us. They don't like Mr. Obama. They don't trust him. And quite frankly, it's for very good reason. Chad, I'm hoping that one day real soon we can talk to you and not be so alarmist. But then again, we are only being realists here more than anything else. As always, I thank you so much for your time. Look forward to the next time. Thank you. All right, take care. Rand Paul could be a day away from entering the 2016 race for the White House. And what would a Hillary presidency mean for the future of the U.S. once he gets involved? Left versus right and more when Midpoint continues.